This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly brought to you by Casio Electronic Music Instruments. Well, I guess in the initial interview, if I um, meet a potential student where piano is one of 17 activities in their week, <laughs> my next question is, okay, so when when are you going to practice? If they cannot actually name practice times in the week, if they haven't set aside the time to practice, then I explain that this isn't really going to work. There are a few parents who think that piano works as just yet another activity in the week, that they can drop their kids off for half an hour and that's piano done. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio, and become a more creative piano teacher. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to episode number six in season one of 2018 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. You're listening to episode number 122. And if you're one of my inner circle piano teaching community members, a special welcome to you. My name is Tim Topham, your host for the show where you can get weekly inspiration, ideas, business and teaching strategies to help support your teaching and grow your studio. And, you know, if this is your first time here, thank you very much for tuning in. I hope you get a lot of value from it. I know the next three episodes, it's a three-part series, is literally going to blow your mind. It is so good. I can't wait to share it with you. Today's show notes, full transcript and all links uh, and the images we talk about in these episodes are available at timtopham.com slash episode 122. Motivation and practice are two of the topics I get asked for my opinion on more than just about anything else, except maybe chords and pop music. So I've asked an absolute superstar of the piano teaching world to join us to unpack this issue. Today is part one of a three-part mini-series all about motivation, and not just student motivation, but we're also going to look at parent motivation, the theory behind music lessons generally, and ways to get more proactive rather than reactive when it comes to your own students. In part one, which is today's episode, we're going to be looking at a subject that is a huge issue for every music teacher. In fact, it might just be the biggest one. <laughs> I've experienced it, you've experienced it, everyone has, and it doesn't matter how much you change or charge, how much technology you use or how amazing your studio is, we all have to deal with it. We're going to talk about it in just a moment. In part two next week, we're going to look at the area of parent motivation and unpack your progress matrix. This might be completely new for you. And then in part three, we're going to talk about the three basic needs of all piano students and how this impacts on motivation and what you do in your studio. Sound cool? Oh, you're going to love this. My guest today is a professional pianist and teacher with three decades experience in both private and group tuition. She's the author and publisher of Blitz Books, the music education series that has captured the imagination of students across Australia and now the UK and transformed the teaching of music theory, sight reading and general knowledge. She has a bachelor's degree in music from the New South Wales Conservatorium, majoring in piano performance. She has had extensive experience as a solo performer and accompanist and also enjoys singing in a cappella ensembles. She continues to teach at Australian music schools where she specializes in theory and musicianship classes. She speaks internationally at conferences and workshops and her ongoing dedication to making music education as fun as possible has seen her find many ways to engage students' interest and enthusiasm. In fact, it was her presentation at the APPC last year in Adelaide that made me decide that I just had to get her on the podcast. Samantha Coates, welcome to the show. Thank you, Tim. It's Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's so Thanks good hanging out me. with you. Um, this is actually your second appearance on the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. The last time you were on, we were doing a two-part series called Everything But The Pieces with your great friend, Abe Citronowski. And that was all about how to prepare exam students effectively for those supplemental tests, general knowledge, sight reading, oral tests, and how to fit all that in. So uh, that was episode 18 and 19, and I strongly encourage listeners to check those two episodes out. Even if you don't send kids for exams, you're going to get a lot of benefit from them. So as I mentioned in the introduction, this is the first in a three-part series we're hosting all about motivation because it's one of the questions I get asked the most. And the question is, Sam, you've heard it too, how do I get my kids to practice? We all hope that there's an easy fix and a one-size-fits-all solution, but unfortunately, 
it's just not the case because every student and situation is different and we all get motivated by different things. So in today's part one episode, we're looking specifically at issues around overscheduling. It's a big problem or can be a big problem. Next week, we'll be exploring the often neglected aspect of parent motivation. And then in part three, we're going to pull it all together by exploring Samantha's three needs of every piano student and particularly how that relates to repertoire. So Samantha, I think before we dive in today, we better clarify quickly this concept of overscheduling. What does that mean to you and how is it impacting on piano lessons? Well, thank you for asking that. It is a huge problem and uh, it's something that as piano teachers, we can't really do we can't really do anything about it. It basically means that piano students or any music students really are fitting piano into just the teensiest, weetsiest little corner of their lives. And for many, it's just another activity that they do in the week. So uh, we have to somehow work around that right? and motivate those students as well as the ones who are actually, um, want, you know, a bit dedicated. Yeah. And so do you feel this has become a bigger problem these days than it might have been 10, 20 years ago? Yes, much bigger problem. I think that in the 21st century, parents are, well, I think there are three reasons why why kids are overscheduled. So the first reason is competitive reasons. Uh, they compete student and parent. So, uh, there's more tutoring happening across the board. Everybody needs marks to get into this, that, and the other school and scholarship. Uh, then there are parents who wish to experience vicarious success through their children. Uh, <laughs> so there's that competitive nature. And there's also parents who just want their kids to try everything. You know, give every activity a go. Let's see what you're good at. Right. So there's compet- that's all that's all the first reason, competitive. And then the second reason is that there are just there's often just babysitting needed. Parents are working full time. They're not around to supervise their kids' downtime. Downtime isn't even what it used to be. Uh, they're not out riding a bike or playing in the playground. Right. Yeah. They're twiddling their thumbs on Xbox. And that leads to the third reason, which I think children are overscheduled because parents are desperate to keep their kids active. And I know I'm guilty of this with my own children. Uh, I know my son is very addicted to screen and I would prefer to book him into an hour of swimming Mm. than to um, know that he's sitting around and and I'm trying to get him off the Xbox. It's, it's tricky. So, uh, that's only going to become more and more, uh, important as time goes on, right? Yes. Yes. As life gets more and more sedentary, uh, then at least ha- having activities is a way to keep children active. Mm. And I think that that in a way it's it, parents are a bit backed into a corner. I have felt this way myself for sure. Right. Yeah. Well, you can definitely understand it better than I can from a parent perspective. <laughs> so good to get that angle. Do you think that um, music and art, uh, I, I get a feeling that piano teachers and music educators feel that, uh, you know, sport and dance are, are really, and sport in particular, I guess, are the real priorities after school, swimming and those kinds of things. And music almost takes the smallest of the already small time available. Do you think that's a reality? I do think that is a reality mainly because of the way those activities play out. So sport is much more social. Sport also doesn't require solitary practice in between. There may be training sessions, but they are run by a coach. Uh, They are a social activity in, in themselves as well as being active. So with sport, there are supervised sessions that go on and the parent isn't really responsible for overseeing anything outside of what the coach or the team might do. So that makes it easier for the parent. Uh, with Same with dance, even elite ballet dancers, if they dance 10 hours a week, they're there with a teacher. I mean, if we had our students coming for piano lessons 10 hours a week, we could mould <laughs> a concert pianist out of everybody. We right. could. Yeah. That the, the fact is with music is we see them half an hour a week and they've got to then do that solitary progress on their own with hopefully with some parental support during the week in order to in order to see progress. Right. They don't and 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 that's really tricky so I think music is a more difficult pursuit from that point of view. It takes commitment from the family. Mm. Um, okay, so I think we can agree that we all have overscheduled kids in our studio and the ones that aren't are definitely in the minority. So I guess the big question, Samantha, is what 
on earth do we do about it? What are your tips and some strategies for us? Okay, well, the, the short answer really is there's nothing we can do about the actual overscheduling. Okay. Uh, the, the so you haven't tried talking to is, parents and convincing them that they're overscheduling their kids or anything like that? Well, I guess in the initial interview, if I um, meet a potential student where piano is one of 17 activities in their week, <laughs> my next question is, okay, so when, when are you going to practice? If they cannot actually name practice times in the week, if they haven't set aside the time to practice, then I explain that this isn't really going to work. There are a few parents who think that piano works as just yet another activity in the week, that they can drop their kids off for half an hour and that's piano done. So right. uh, it's a matter of it's, parent education mm. is everything. I was just going to say it's about parent education, isn't it? And just as yes. much as we have to, uh, well, I've I've had to teach parents about helping set practice routines and timetabling time and things, things that I would assume parents know, many of them don't know. So we do have to educate them in some ways. Yes, we do. I have this thing uh, called the seven deadly practice sins. And uh, the first four of those sins are uh, to do with what the parent has set up at home. So if there's no routine or there's no support, I don't think I'm actually going to be able to remember these off by heart actually. <laughs> but um, the quality of the instrument, the position of the instrument, they're all things within the parent's control. Um, another thing, but the, the last three of the seven deadly practice sins have more to do with the teacher. The teacher has to set a structure for the lesson and have decent repertoire to practice and have has to set really good goals oh, sorry structure for practicing teach the student how to practice so uh, it's really a triangle in order for piano to work there has to be an understanding that there's a student and a teacher and a parent there are the things that are completely outside the child's control uh, is the routine of the week they really don't set their own routine it's completely up to the parents and if the parent has scheduled them so ridiculously throughout the entire week so that they don't have a minute to practice they can't do piano they just can't do it uh and or if they're never there if there's no supervision to that practice then the practice is going to be it'll be okay it'll be right. okay but mostly it'll be uh they'll, they'll be shiny cut polishes mm. like um mm. that philip what's his name Philip, Philip uh, who does it? Philip Johnson yeah. says, "Yes, one of the types of practices. You're a shiny cup polisher. You just, um, you simply practice the things you know." Exactly. So, so we've got. Let's let's say uh, little James is starting piano lessons. We've talked to the parents about making sure he's got some time, and we think there's enough time in his even over scheduled schedule to do this. Um, what other things can we look at that that we can take uh, responsibility for? Okay. Well, then we need to talk about how we're going to motivate that student how and what, what our expectations are of that student and how we're going to offer them rewards because right. re rewards are really uh, necessary but have to be very, very carefully used because there's all different types of um, motivation. So um, there are um, you know, everything from uh, a sticker to um, yes, yes, you've done really well to praise to actually bribing them with money, these all fall along the lines of extrinsic motivation. Uh, I was I was bribed with money when I was a kid. I remember it well. <laughs> and one it one and two dollars back in those days. One and two dollars, yeah. and that probably worked for the first couple of weeks. Yeah. It probably worked for a while, and then after a while, either you needed more money to get it to <laughs> keep working, or it kind of just stopped working because you thought this activity, it's not. If it's not working for you, then the money doesn't make a difference. And uh, it's like paying your child to take out the garbage. If you do that once, you're never going to get them to take out the garbage without paying them. Mm. So actually, Tim, if you were paid to do your practice, then did you ever practice for no payment? Well, look, I did, funnily enough. Uh, it was, <laughs> she, she used to just give me uh, like $2 if I just do these two bars really well and it's a really hard passage. So it would just be bits and pieces and it would never be that regular, but it would be like uh, she'd have a little bit of money on the side of the piano. And I've always oh, wondered about your, that, doing that with my own studio. So it's an interesting question. It was your teacher who was paying you, not your parents. Correct. 
Yeah. Ah, okay. So I, that that's that's an interesting scenario again. So there are a lot of parents who bribe their children to practice. Oh, uh, okay. And okay. after a while, like they'll say their pocket money is contingent on their practice. Uh, that that yeah. will fall apart after a while. But um, it sounds like your teacher was using that as a reward and actually using it cleverly because she was using it as what's called a now that reward rather than an if then reward. You didn't know if it was coming. It was a form of praise in a way. It was a, it was like a prize. Right. Was it? Yes, that's you, true. Yeah. Also, it, it depended. Sometimes it would be, okay, by next week, if you can do that, it's $2 for you. So it, it was oh, both. It okay. could have been either. Yeah. It was, it was a motivator. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. All of those rewards have to be carefully used because there are really, I mean, ultimately two things that motivate most students to practice. Uh, number one is sheer panic, fear mm-hmm. of humiliation. <laughs> And number two is rewards, any kind of reward. And all of those fall along the lines of extrinsic motivation. So it just depends whether uh, a child is negatively engaged or positively engaged. Right. So if if you're not, and I've talked about a matrix before, a motivation matrix. So you yeah. can be, if you're positively engaged, and but it's all for extrinsic motivators, then that's the really conchy student who wants an A plus or just loves getting stickers and uh, loves getting, you know, given $2 and whatever in, for doing something in a lesson. And they might be very highly motivated to do it. Then there's, but if you're negatively engaged, it'll be because fear of failing an exam or perhaps you're practicing to avoid punishment. That's being very negatively engaged with extrinsic motivators. Oh, okay, yeah. So um, practicing to avoid something negative is is not not a great way to come about things obviously right. yeah now where we all want to be eventually where we want to push our students eventually is to be positively engaged and intrinsically motivated to basically means you're doing piano for the love of it and the our adult students are mostly there. Most adults come along and there's only run, one reason why they want to learn the piano. No one's told them to. Uh, they're not being competitive about it. They just love it. They just want to. And that's pure intrinsic motivation. But our our child students are not really there yet. And that's fair enough. They they learn piano because their parents want them to learn the piano. Mm-hmm. And there, there might be the odd young student who is intrinsically motivated. And that's that's a rare gift. And if any teachers have any of those, gee, hang on to them because they're (laughs) gorgeous. They're amazing. But it's fair enough for for children to be motivated extrinsically. And we just have to use the rewards carefully to gradually coach them into finding the pleasure in piano for themselves, to find that intrinsic motivation for themselves. But they need to have, if they don't have any successes along the way, they're not going to really discover the intrinsic motivation. And it's hard work. Practice is hard work, so we do need to motivate them. Now, a quick word from our sponsor, Casio Electronic Music Instruments. As many of you will know if you've been listening to the podcast for any length of time, I've been trialing out the Selviano Grand Hybrid Piano in my studio, and uh, it's now become my main teaching and my own practicing instrument, and I've got to say that I'm thoroughly enjoying using it. Uh, Of course, many of you will know the benefits of a hybrid piano, um, including things like uh, the recording functions you've got, the choice of different sounds, the fact that students or yourself, you can wear headphones while using it, you don't need to pay removalists to move it around your studio or house, and the fact that it never needs tuning and obviously limited maintenance so they're all fantastic but how does it actually sound and feel to play well pretty amazing Uh, and I really I'm not a concert pianist so to me this is absolutely as good as a full length normal acoustic grand piano Uh, and it does have all the wooden keys and the normal mechanism you'd expect so what I would really recommend you do is head to soundtechnology.com.au to find out where your local stockists of this instrument are and uh, go and test one out today i really believe that you'll find not only is it a fantastic instrument but it's also at a price point that really sets it apart from its competitors i used to think and i in fact i think i have an old blog post about why extrinsic motivation doesn't work but i think you've convinced me because i've heard you speak a number of times that actually it does at the right time and particularly in the beginning am i right in thinking that's your uh, take yes i think that as you say, it needs to come at the right time. It needs to, they need to be used carefully and there needs to not be an expectation that everything will get a reward. 
So if a teacher is always giving out money or always giving out um, stickers or chocolate, then eventually that student will not find any motivation to do it without those little rewards. But if they're given out occasionally as a surprise, like, oh my goodness, you you did that so incredibly, um, here, have a Mars bar, yeah. then, um, then the, the student might be so delighted at that and not have expected it, that it, it, it's just a nice um, validation right. of what they've done. Uh, and but the main the main satisfaction really should come from actually being able to play something. Yeah, the, I, the satisfaction shouldn't come from the chocolate. It should come from the sense of achievement. We mm. just have to reward them in little bits along the way so they can actually achieve. Some need more than others. Right. Yeah. So I've just written down for my own notes here: motivators versus rewards. Th- these these are different. Uh, I, I think I'm learning from you in this conversation. So it's if you're going to say like my teacher did, here's you'll get a Mars bar next week if this happens. Then that's using that to motivate them, uh, which is a very external way to do it. However, if you just say, okay, this needs to be done by next week, and I can't wait to hear how you, how you go with it, and they come back and it's amazing, and you give them a little reward, then that's a different way. That that's not an extrinsic. Well, motivator that's right the the reward came as a surprise the reason why they actually work to do it is because you said work on this i would love to hear you doing this next week right Uh, and interestingly working for somebody's approval is also classified as extrinsic motivation Um, (laughs) right so So i should rephrase that (laughs) well it's it's hard to know so what is intrinsic well dan pink in his author of drive he classifies what motivation is all about so he says um we're we're very motivated in extrinsically uh and certainly we evolved like that so what he calls the old operating system of motivation (laughs) 1.0 is when we were cavemen and when our primary goals were to hunt for food, find water, protect our young and procreate. And these were all extrinsic motivators to simply stay alive. Right. And then as we became civilized, we moved on to what he calls motivation 2.0, which is where we work for a living. We we work to get to survive. We are actually all centered around reward and punishment. Reward the behavior you want, punish or ignore the behavior you don't want but everything in what we do is motivated by the reward and punishment system Um, reward can be a paycheck reward can be somebody's love uh, but it's it's all to do with wanting to um, improve our lives Mm. so um, but then what Dan Pink calls motivation 3.0 which is we've evolved further is the intrinsic motivation so, so, for example, what is it that might make you want to work out a puzzle? So, Tim, have you heard the one uh, where someone's looking at a photograph? There's a man looking at a photograph and he says, brothers and sisters, have I none, but that man's father is my father's son. Uh, I, it sounds like a familiar riddle, yes. <laughs> now, if I said to you, do you want me to tell you the answer? You might say, no, 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 give me a minute. Yeah, I'll I'll try it, yeah. Yes, most people don't just want to be told the answer to a riddle or or a puzzle. They do want to go working it out. What is it that makes us want to work out any puzzle? There is no reward for doing it. (laughs) There is no punishment for not doing it. This is pure intrinsic motivation. Right. The only reward is the activity itself. And so that's our goal for our students. This is obviously what we want to get them to. So I guess the question is, how uh, how do we get there and how soon might that happen for the average student who's pretty busy and overscheduled? That's a good question. And I know that in the motivation matrix, uh, if I, I started off being negatively engaged and extrinsically motivated, um, I refused to practice, basically. Mm. I said I didn't want to. So my mother took my piano lessons away from me when right. I was five. And then for some reason, when I was six, I started playing again. I don't know why. And so I got my lessons back. But I think, and and then I was positively engaged, but very extrinsically motivated. I think I stayed there for at least 25 years. I enjoyed 
doing exams. I enjoyed playing, giving recitals. I enjoyed approval from others and good marks. But it's probably only been in the last 15 years or so where I've really truly, you know, there's no more exams. There's no more recitals. I just love it. I love playing piano for myself and for nobody else. Mm. That's, that's, you know, if we can all get there eventually, and I think most, most people are, I'm sure most people who are listening to this would be intrinsically motivated. Mm. But if you think about where you were as a, as a small child or where you were as a teenager, it's, it's probably different. And mm. there's one more aspect we didn't talk about, and that is if you're intrinsically motivated but negatively engaged, mm. that is the people who maybe um, desperately want to learn an instrument but there's, there's no money or they're not enjoying their lesson because they don't like their teacher. So it, that, that can also happen. There are like these four options for intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and to be positively and negatively engaged. So th- this is uh, on an axis, right? I'm picturing uh, X and Y axis yeah. and four quadrants. Yeah. So do, yes. you, do you have an example of this we could either put on the show notes or link to on your blog? Yes, I absolutely do. Yeah. Um, so uh, printable people can have a look at. It's Fantastic. called the motivation matrix. Yeah, I think this is, this is really a uh, really good way of thinking about it because I haven't thought so much about the connection between the intrinsic and extrinsic motivators and the positive and negative engagement. And I think it's you, what you're doing is really making this um, connection between the two and it's a very important connection. So I hope the people listening have gone, oh, that's actually made me think about things because it has for me. Um, and they can check out that, uh, that matrix on the show notes uh, page. I think that that would be great. You mentioned at the start that we can potentially alleviate some of these issues about overscheduling in our initial parent interviews and enrollment procedures. What about, uh, is there anything we can do in studio policies about this that could help? I think everybody needs an ironclad studio policy in this day and age because there are so many other activities. And if a, if a child is enrolled in things like sport where there's going to suddenly be a grand final or ballet where there's going to suddenly be a concert and extra rehearsals pop up and then they suddenly uh, have to miss their piano lesson. If there is not a strict policy in place with the teacher that those lessons will still have to be paid for, those piano lessons are going to be skipped Mm. without a second thought for those other activities. Whereas if if a teacher has a policy which says, no, there are no makeup lessons. It's a term fee. Uh, you, you you have to attend regardless. The parent will think twice about all the other commitments, mm, that's uh, true. or or at least not leave you in the lurch. Like mm. be very up upfront about it. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I, yeah. And and we've got some uh, some resources on my blog about studio policies and I've, I've shared um, a number of them around. So uh, yeah, definitely have a look at that. Make sure your policy is clear and agreed to by the parents and that you stick to it, which is often one of the hardest parts of studio policies. Now, I'd like to start bringing things together and wrapping up this first part in the series. Um, for teachers who are out there and uh, happily giving out stickers and, and awards at the moment, rewards, uh, what would you say to them? Do they need to change their behavior straight away or is there some subtle things they could do to change an extrinsic motivator into a reward? Oh, look, I am a huge fan of stickers and chocolate. And in fact, I've been called a a terrible teacher when it comes to my students' teeth. (laughs) Uh, uh, I've been guilty of giving out so many things. I think the trick is to make, to use the rewards carefully enough so that they are uh, an if, uh, sorry, a now that reward. Now that you've done this, here's that reward. Mm. If, If the practice is always contingent on that reward, that's where the rewards lose their effect. They will absolutely lose their effect over time. So it's great to give out stickers, but eventually a tolerance will set in right. for stickers. They, they won't be so much fun. Um, I had a thing going in my studio for a long time to do with jelly beans, but I used the jelly beans not as rewards as sweets, like actually that, that, They could eat a jelly bean if they did something, but they went into a jar to show the uh, number of practices they'd done during the week. So it was a bit novel because they they thought they were getting sweets, but actually they weren't. It was just going into their jar. It was looking good. And at the end of the term, they could see their practice building up. 
And it was a very elaborate system to do with getting one jelly bean per time they practiced, but also losing one jelly bean per day they didn't practice. So they started to get a sense that, um, well, they could see from their jars that infrequent practice didn't really do much. Right. Uh, that it, it, practice needs to be fairly frequent and consistent. So thinking up uh, schemes are lots of fun mm. for, for teachers to do. And it's just a matter of monitoring to see if students are motivated only by the chocolate or the jelly beans or if they are going to hopefully do it anyway and then those rewards are just a bonus. Right. I remember seeing your jelly bean presentation at uh, the Australian conference. <laughs> it was great. It was quite elaborate. Um, did you have information about that on online anywhere? There is a blog on, on my blog called the okay. Jelly Bean Blog. It's actually a guest post written by my daughter who was my student at the time oh, great. and uh, who writes it all from her point of view about the instigation of the scheme and how mortified she was to find out she was going to lose jelly beans. <laughs> um, it was so very, it's it very clever. Well. Yeah, okay, we'll make sure we uh, get a link to that and we'll pop that in the show notes. So, look, in, in summary, if I kind of summarize what I've, I've picked up today, um, we've, we started by talking about the three reasons for the overscheduling, uh, some interesting ones about the competition of the parents uh, there. We talked about uh, why sport and dance and some of those group activities are actually different and why they might get priority. Um, and we talked about the fact that we really can't fix overscheduling, but we have to uh, try and engage and motivate our students and, and help them get to the point of intrinsic motivation in order that they want to spend more time, their limited time, doing their music practice. Um, we also covered the parent-student triangle. You mentioned that, and I think that is a really crucial connection that we can all make. Uh, and then we talked about the progress matrix. Uh, that's what you called it, wasn't it? It's the motivation matrix. Sorry, actually. motivation we'll, matrix. We will talk about the progress matrix uh in the next episode. All oh, right, so, so many matrices. Um, yeah. So that that was um, where we were talking about the difference between positive and negative engagement and intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Uh, it's just such a great way to visualize it. So we'll make sure we pop a, uh, a, a either a link to that or the actual matrix on the show notes so people can check that out. Uh, and then we finish by talking about uh, now that rewards and that maybe that's a good option for teachers who would like to continue offering stickers and awards and prizes and things like that, but just making sure that practice isn't contingent on the student being given something. How's that for a summary? Was that was that right? That sounds absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Great. Was there anything we missed? Not at all. No. Yeah, well. um, yes. For people who are wondering, I think it's, um, you know, we haven't really quite answered the question of exactly how we motivate students and get into the intrinsic motivation that's what we will be talking about in the next couple of episodes and it's mostly to do with repertoire fantastic well i'm really looking forward to part two which is coming up next week uh thanks so much for your time again today thanks tim thanks right. for having me see you next week thanks bye I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. Uh, it's so great talking to Samantha. I always enjoy it and get so much value from it as I know you will have from listening. Uh, no doubt you'll probably want to check out the uh, transcript or get the links and things like that that we've mentioned. So feel free to head to timtopham.com slash episode 122 uh, to find out more. Now, a couple of reminders before we finish off today. I've got my next webinar. It's happening in two weeks on Wednesday, the 28th of March. That'll be my usual time of 8 a.m., which means that for those of you in America, it'll be your Tuesday, the 27th of March, 1 p.m., I think, Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern, London, normally 9 p.m. the night before. And for those of you in Perth, uh, often and Singapore and Hong Kong often a little bit earlier. I do apologize for that. But that's Wednesday, the 28th of March, 8 a.m. Melbourne time. And it's all about inspiring adults. I'm going to give you a whole lot of tips and strategies and how to deal with uh, things like performance anxiety in adults and also how to teach really slow progressing adults, which often happens, uh, and those who um, you know have very busy work lives. So a whole lot of tips there coming your way. To find out more and to register, head to timtopham.com slash webinar. Now, next week on the podcast, as I mentioned, we're going to be talking all about parent motivation. And I don't want to give too much away, but I will just say that this is an area that very few teachers even think about. And uh, when I heard what content Sam was able to, uh, to produce for us, 
you made me think, why haven't I thought about this before? So that's next week. Stay tuned for part two in our three-part series with Samantha Coates. I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. See you next time. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.